Good evening, everyone, and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Questions and Answers Time for a Friday evening. These broadcasts are live every Friday at about 9.30 p.m. Eastern, and this program is designed to interact with you with your questions and comments related to the Bible, and we'll try to respond as well as possible by going to the Bible. If you're calling us by phone with your questions or comments, dial 209-647-1600 and enter the access code 181610, followed by the pound key, which gets you into conference. Then press star 6 and then 1. If you're using Skype, press the free conference call button, then press the dial pad button and enter access code 181610 and press your pound key. And to get in line to ask a question, press star 6 and one. And if you're using Pal Talk, you simply go to eBible Fellowship's room, and once inside the room, you can raise your hand, and when you're asked to, you can post your question. And so, with our Bibles at the ready, it's now time to turn things over to our speaker for this Friday evening questions and answers time, and say hello to Chris McCann. Good evening, Chris. Thank you. And now at this time, we will open up the room if anyone has a question. For a comment you like to make, you're welcome and invited uh, to do so. Uh, feel free to say whatever you like. And I'll try to respond as much as possible by going to the Bible. As the Bible is the Word of God, and God has um, he, he has given us a certain methodology of uh, looking into His Word, in order that we might be able to discover truth and and to find out um, the truth about um, what he is saying there. Now, we can't always do this, but as long as we're uh, following the proper procedure, as long as we're praying to him for wisdom and asking that he open up His word to us, that is, we're not going proudly, uh, but humbly, recognizing that of ourselves we don't know anything, and and that uh, uh, when it comes to spiritual matters, God must show us. He has to open our understanding. Then we can we can expect to learn. We can expect to uh, begin to understand certain things. And, you know, um, in the day we're living in, God has actually um, showed us a great deal of information since May 21, uh, where we're, we're not in the dark. We, we have a very good understanding of what's going on. We lack information in um, one area, the, the duration of Judgment Day, but as far as many other things, God is opening up much information. Well, uh, if you have a question, uh, please uh, just raise your hand or or contact us in the ways that were just laid out, and I'd be happy to respond. Let's go to the first person on the phones tonight. Welcome to our Friday night question and answer time. Jersey Mike 2 asks, Should a true believer know that he is saved? Every time I fall into sin, it gives me doubts about my salvation. It's been harder than it's ever been before. I have been struggling more than I have ever been before. Should I feel comforted at this point in time? No, not not necessarily. Um, We are uh, in a period of time in which our faith is being tried. And um, so, so it's, it's very possible that, um, well, for one, that there are certain people that are not saved. And two, we may be a child of God. And yet, uh, due to these intense circumstances, we may be struggling for a time, you know, it, it's um, it's interesting that we read in John 21, and John 21 is that chapter 
in which there was a great catch of fish, 153 fish, and a great multitude of fish were were brought to, to Christ. And we realize in this chapter that um, this was describing spiritually the great catch of the of the elect during the great tribulation period and and John 21 is uh going to get into the focus of judgment day or the believers focus during this time of living in the world during judgment day and to the believers uh to Peter representing the the true believer he says Feed my sheep. He he asked him three times if he loves him. Uh, I, I shouldn't have um, quickly gone over that, but um, and and that's significant too because um, how do we love Christ? If you love me, keep my commandments. So here is an emphasis of Christ uh, where he is in dialogue with the believers. And he is asking this question, if we love him, and and that is, that will be um, in view as part of this trial, do we love Christ? That That's a big um, reason why uh, there is a trial of faith to reveal whether or not we love him. And then uh, in response to this, Jesus says, um, uh, feed my sheep three times or um, feed my lambs and then feed my sheep a couple of other times. But three times uh, the directive is given that we are to share the gospel in order that the elect hear. And that's what it is to feed sheep. We we have a commission from God. It's not the great commission to go into the world with the gospel that individuals might become saved. It's a commission to go into the world with the gospel that the elect might hear and be fed. And uh, actually, we would carry it out uh, almost identically to, to the first task of the Great Commission because we don't know where the elect are in the world. So we have to broadcast it everywhere. But then following this, following um, uh, this this uh, third time, Jesus um, says, do you love me? And, and Peter responds in verse 17 and said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, Thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest, but when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. Now, this is interesting, because um, if, if you remember back in the book of Ecclesiastes, in chapter 12, which um, we... We went over during the study of Isaiah, chapter 24. And it says in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 1, Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them, while the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain. And if we read this carefully, we realize that God is referring to two periods of time, the days of youth, which um, it, it, it can be said that those days are not evil and the sun, moon, and stars are not darkened. And the days after youth or old age in which the description would change to they are evil days and the sun and the moon and the stars are darkened. And evil day is judgment day. 
It's today. And that's what verse 17, verse 18 of John 21 um, is, is um, uh, referring to. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, that is, before the evil days come, before judgment day, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, now the evil days have come. The sun is dark and the moon's not giving its light and the stars have fallen. It is the time that we are presently in when darkness, a thick darkness in a spiritual sense, has overtaken the earth. That thou shalt stretch forth thy hands and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. Now, um, some, some commentators have pointed out how Peter, according to um, the secular or church history, was crucified upside down. And so they, they feel that this language is referring to his crucifixion. And, of course, it has to do with his death. And notice at the end of uh, in uh, part B of verse 19, and when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, follow me. Now, many times Jesus has said, take up your cross and follow me. This is the nature of, of living in in the world at this time, we are um, basically living a life in which we are crucifying the flesh, we are mortifying our members upon the earth, we are dying that during these days to self. Now let's turn to Second Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9, where it says, As unknown and yet well known as dying, and behold, we live. Now that that's a, a statement that is describing the Christian life. We are dying because we were dead to the world. Um, well, let, let's start here because uh, this... This may get interesting uh, because we're going to go to Revelation 14 also. But when we became a child of God, we were dead in Christ. We, we are baptized with him in, into his death. And so God views us as being dead. But at the same time, we're still alive and we're living in the world. But now... We're, we're commanded to take up our cross, and that means we do not um, go after sins like we used to. We want to do things God's way more and more. And, and so as dying, it is, it is an ongoing um, uh, event, it, a, a, a death daily. We are daily dying to self in order to live unto Christ. And, and this is the nature of the believer at all times. But God makes an interesting statement in the book of Revelation in chapter 14. And this chapter unmistakably speaks of judgment day. And it says, for instance, in verse 10, and the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Now look at verse um, verse 14 and I looked and behold a white cloud and upon the cloud one sat like unto the son of man 
having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle, and it continues to speak of reaping in the day of judgment. So now we we have um, the verses I read earlier, uh, beginning in verse 10. You could even go back a little before that. And it's judgment day. And then the verse beginning in verse 14, it's judgment day. Well, have you ever noticed what's in between these verses? What What God placed in the context on both sides like bookends of judgment day it says in verse 12 here is the patience of the saints here are they that keep the commandments of god and the faith of jesus and remember how uh, we've noticed for some time how patience is key and in, in in patience possess ye your souls this is a time after having done the will of god you have need of patience so here is the patience of the saints and and then it goes on in verse 13 and i heard a voice from heaven saying unto me right blessed are the dead which die in the lord from henceforth yea saith the spirit that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. What an unusually strange place to put this verse. I I couldn't think of a stranger place. For one thing, if um, if if uh, individuals who refuse to uh, acknowledge that this is Judgment Day because they think well, the believers wouldn't be here. No, the believers would be taken out of the world. Well, why on earth? And why on earth would God speak of Judgment Day in the way he has and then say right in the middle of that context, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. And Henceforth is a very particular word that means from now. It's, it cannot mean at an earlier point, but from this point on, from now, is what henceforth means. How, how is this possible? Where did these people come from? We just read about the the cup of wrath and fire and brimstone. And following this, it gets right back into a discussion of Christ in the clouds, putting in the sickle. And who are these people? And even if it's referring to those who physically die in the Lord from, from now, well, what are they doing on earth? And they certainly can't be in heaven dying in either a physical or a spiritual sense. They must be on earth, and they must be right in the midst of Judgment Day itself. And from that point on, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. Now, the the dead would be those that have become dead in Christ. And we won't go to the verses. Uh, There's many of them that show that uh, that's the language of the Bible. We become dead with him, which die in the Lord. You know, when we went to 2 Corinthians 6, verse 9, as dying, we live. It's the same Greek word that is translated dying that is found here in Revelation 14 and verse 13. It is a word that speaks of a process. It is a word that 
indicates an ongoing death, not having died, past tense. It's a present word. Dying in the Lord because we are taking up our cross. This is why Jesus said to Peter in, in that context of John 21 that uh, he, he spoke of his death and what death he would glorify God and then said, follow me. And so the, the believers, the great multitude, millions and millions and millions of people around the world are dead in Christ and are dying in the Lord since we've entered into this this point of time and through this dying in the Lord we are making manifest uh, certain truths that that the Bible speaks of but anyway uh, getting to your question it, it's very possible that we could be struggling during this time it these are very hard days and and so we we want to stay um, beseeching the Lord, crying out to Him, asking Him for strength to help us. And we can we can pray, O oh Lord, having had mercy, have mercy, and grant me Your Spirit, strengthen me with might in the inner man, that I might be able to keep Thy commandments, that I might be able to take up my cross, because. That's the test during these days to um, to do so in a God-glorifying manner. But thank you for that question. Let's go to the next person on the phones. Welcome to eBible's Question and Answer. Hey, Chris, could you please read Ezekiel 23, verses 31 through 34? Ezekiel 23, 31 through 34? Yes, sir. Okay. Says in verse 31, um, Thou hast walked in the way of thy sister, therefore will I give her cup into thine hand. Thus saith the Lord Jehovah, Thou shalt drink of thy sister's cup, deep and large. Thou shalt be laughed to scorn and had in derision. It contained much. Thou shalt be filled with drunkenness and sorrow, with a cup of astonishment and desolation, with a cup of thy sister Samaria. Thou shalt even drink it and suck it out, and thou shalt break the sherds thereof and pluck off thine own breast, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord Jehovah. Well, I got a comment, and you can please correct me if I'm wrong, but God is speaking to Ahola and Aholaba. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's speaking of national Israel and the churches and congregations. And I notice in verse 31, God says he's going to take the cup from one sister's hand. And put it in the other sister's hand. And I notice that there's no change in the cup. It's the same exact cup. Mm -hmm. And it says, well, filled with drunkenness and sorrow and astonishment. Yeah. Well, it, it is uh, referring to the judgment on the churches. And um, both Ahola and Aholaba, or um, Israel, the ten tribes, Samaria, and Judah, both typify the, the churches and congregations, just as um, Shiloh typifies the churches and congregations under God's judgment. Um, it, it, it's interesting that, that it says um, you'll drink of the cup, your sister's cup, and, and so God is giving it from one to the other, and it makes us it, it it sort of leads us to that idea of a transition from the church to the world, but but um, uh, historically it would refer to the divided tribes, and spiritually I think both point to the church. You notice in uh, Jeremiah 25, though, he has this cup that he gave to Jerusalem and Judah, so if he handed it to them, and then that same cup would have been transferred off to the world, which means they would have also no hope, no salvation. You know, after Christ hung on the cross, the nation of Israel and the uh, synagogues, there was no salvation available but judgment. And then the churches and congregations, if that cup was taken from national Israel and handed to the churches and congregations, and Christ left the church in 88, 
there would be no hope, no salvation, just judgment. And if he took that same cup that he gave to national Israel and the churches and congregations, and in Jeremiah 25, he took it off and handed it to the world, could we also transfer that that same cup now is saying that there's no salvation, just judgment on the world? Well, yeah, that that is uh, what Jeremiah 25 is teaching. It's showing us that um, God gave the cup first to the city called by his name, which would represent the church. And then following that, he says to the world, uh, if I punished my own people, shall you be utterly unpunished? You shall not be unpunished. And then he proceeds to give the cup to them. And it's it's identical. We, we really have to uh, get that into our minds and understand that we were wrong to look for uh, physical destruction of the earth until the it's all over and done. Thank God we'll destroy the earth. But as far as the judgment, the judgment day is it, it's it's a mirror image, pretty much of what he did with the churches, and it was a spiritual judgment upon them of the removal of the gospel blessings and, like you mentioned, salvation. And it's a spiritual judgment on the world where the light is no longer shining um, forth into the world, into the world's darkness, and and God has removed salvation from them. So it really helps a lot when we we have that uh, correctly in mind that that uh, it's another spiritual judgment. There are several of them in the Bible. And and uh, it, this is in keeping with how God has um, brought judgment in the past. Thank you. Thank you for these verses and for your comments. Let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our Friday night question and answer. Hi, Chris. Uh, thank you for taking my call. Oh, you're welcome. Please go ahead. Uh, could you explain John 16:25? John 16, verse 25 says, These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. Yeah, uh, in John 16, even earlier in the same chapter, we we really find a interesting verse in verse 12, where Christ says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. And, and, and so he is implying that he'll say more at a later time. And... And in uh, verse 25, he spoke in Proverbs, but then he says uh, the time comes when he'll no more speak in Proverbs, but speak plainly of the Father. Now, what's helpful is when we go to the book of Second John, and it's also um, found in Third John, but let's go to 2 John, verse 12. And here, John is is uh, cast in really the role of God. And it says in verse 12, Having many things to write unto you, I would not write with paper and ink, but I trust to come unto you and speak face to face that our joy may be full. Now, th- this is similar to Christ's statement in verse 12 of John 16 where he had more to say, but could not say it now. And here John is writing, he has more to write, but he will not write with paper and ink. Now, if John wrote with paper and ink, what what would that be? Well, that would be divine revelation from God at, as God moved in him to speak. And it will be added to the Bible. We would have a fourth John or a fifth John. And, and so John is indicating 
that when he comes he and speaks face to face, that it will not be a result of the written word. This will be a more personal encounter. And if you remember, uh, Mr. Camping did a study years ago uh, on Hebrews. And that, that one statement in Hebrews 8, where it says, finding fault with them. And then he would make a new covenant, having found fault or finding fault with them, meaning the old and the new covenants, the old and new testament. But the fault wasn't in in the word of God, which is perfect. It was in man's understanding of the word of God, which is faulty. And and so what what God determined to do is to seal up the book and then open up the scriptures at the time of the end. And he would guide us into truth through the Holy Spirit. And he would show us so much new information. It would be almost, of course it isn't, almost as if it were additional revelation, as if he were speaking more or definitely giving us more insight as the Bible in its sealed up form, let's put it this way, is like a parable. And and in order to unseal it, to open the scriptures, Christ would have to explain the parable. He would have to make it plain. And that's why this phrase here in 2 John 12, I trust to come unto you and speak face to face. Now, if we go back to Numbers 12, it says here when uh, this is the occasion when Aaron and, and Miriam um, were were basically trying to usurp authority of Moses, and and God was um, making a point that Moses was uh, the one he would speak with, and it says in Numbers twelve, in verse six, and he said, "Hear now my words." If there be a prophet among you, I, Jehovah, will make myself known unto him in a vision, will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth. Now, uh, I forgot to mention in 2 John 12, the words face to face are literally mouth to mouth. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently and not in dark speeches. And the similitude of Jehovah shall he behold. Wherefore then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? See, when God speaks mouth to mouth or face to face, he is not speaking in parables, in dark speeches, but he is speaking plainly. And that's what he has done uh, during the the uh, last 17, well, actually, he opened the seals at the beginning of the Great Tribulation, and they've remained open at this time, where he is very carefully showing us the meaning of the parabolic writings of the Bible, and in that sense, he, he is speaking plainly to us, because we're able to understand so much more. But thank you. For, thank you. Thank you for the that verse and your question. And I would like to thank everyone for sharing your questions or or raising your uh, comments, and especially for bringing up the Bible verses we had an opportunity to read tonight. Lord willing, we'll be back together this Sunday afternoon with our online fellowship, and also have another question and answer uh, at that time. But for now, I'm going to say good night. And may the Lord's perfect will be done. Thank you so much for joining us during this Friday evening questions and answers time. The broadcast is heard live over the Internet beginning at approximately 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time. You may also join our Sunday afternoon broadcast of eBibles Questions and Answers beginning at approximately 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Until then, may the Lord grant us His wisdom and may His perfect will be done. Have a blessed evening. Good night.